good thing about it then, it was ours. It was a personal, it was our secret. Oh, it was like a religion. It was new, it was fresh and it was raw, just what we were looking for. Totally changed my life. It was all about the music. It was all about Street Rave. Street Rave's story starts in the mid to late 80s when the football casuals thing was at its height uh, on the terraces. And on those terraces, uh, three guys met up uh, James Mackay, Ricky McGowan, and uh, DJ Ian Boney Clark. And that's where it all started from. I, I, I was kind of running about with Ricky and we used to do go to the casuals, we were part of the casuals, the casual setup. And um, we were part of the model, the model crowd, Saturday service, that's what it was called, the SS. I met Ricky way back in the football days. Um, he used to, I'd, I'd moved through here and I was travelling back through to Motherwell to go to all the games. And Ricky was a, uh, fancied himself as a graphic designer. Um, so we used to get him to do the all the the sort of flyers and stuff like that for the, the, the mother will sit and mob to, to go to the games and things. I, I met up with him sort of through the casual days, you know what I mean, the, the football days at Motherwell, and he sort of formed a, sort of a friendship from then onwards. Casuals were basically hooligans, short and, short and sweet. Casuals were the main reason why what we are today and we're not we're closing and stuff like that. And the casuals um, had different groups in each different cities, Aberdeen, Dundee's, Edinburgh's and Motherwell. The, the whole thing was a mirror image of, of exactly what happened countrywide because at school, I mean, we always had um, people was into West Ham, people that was into Chelsea, Fulham, and most of the time it was all about who won the fights. It wasn't about who won the football. If you won the football and won the fight, you go down the pub and you celebrate it. But of course, that wasn't my vibe and my thing. But the thing was, it was evident, very much so. To be honest with you, the fighting thing is the, the most important thing about it. Do you know what I mean? The dressing up, the clothes, the one-upmanship, the having a good a good team, a good mob, being well organised, and a lot of it for me was about the clothes. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, the violence thing was. I gave you a buzz, I mean, that was the buzz you got, and the buzz, the anticipation of actually going to the game. But it was all really about, I, I was primarily interested in the, the fashion side of things, do you know what I mean? I really, it was something that I, you know, wanted to have, wanted to be the first to have something before, a, you know, before a different crew. Basically, going from being one of the lads at football, the, the club scene came along, and we ended up, 1988 it was, and we went to, I'm went to Ibiza. And the club scene had really started just to kick off over there. Uh, and we come back, and for the end, it just started to pick up. Club nine happened. Uh, we started going to club nine, uh, and before you know it, we started forgetting about football and we're more into party. Club 9 was then uh, Gary and Hetzel in Motherwell, uh, ran by Jim P. Simpson and DJ was Yogi Houghton at the time. Club 9 started in the Gary and Hetzel in Motherwell in 1989. It started because we were looking for uh, 
place to play the music that we liked. It was uh, soul, house, uh, jazz funk, hip hop, and that's how it started. Nobody in the area played that type of music, so we decided to start our own club. Well, I mean, house music is a bit of a phenomenon. Is I mean, it's like I, I sorry to keep harping on about Northern, but it was different. It was different. You know, back then you were either in rock music and went to rock clubs or discotheques, had a good skinful, good fight at the end of the night, and probably fucked some bird that was pig ugly and you couldn't remember a name the next day. Going to club, going to the house clubs, everything had changed. There was a lot of hangover from from the early jazz funk clubs. A lot of the people getting into house were from the jazz funk scene, were from the disco scene. And, you know, they brought that thing about wearing nice clothes, you know, being respectful to women, you know, being respectful to people from out of town because we were migrated a lot. We all knew each other from different towns. We didn't want to go fighting with them. We wanted to talk about soul music. And I think that was brought to the house scene quite a lot. And people, you know, picked up on it. And you know, I th the police had totally kind of put the foot down with the football thing and there was a lot of guys going around with nothing to do anymore, you know, they weren't knocking skulls. So what they were going to go and do, go to a club and find out about house music. I was really there in the early days of hip hop in the same way and I was really turned on by that music when it first started. There was nothing like it and it was really exciting. And the same thing with house music. But the difference is with house music, it was our scene. You know, with the hip hop thing, it was always, um, you're not black so you can't be as good. We were pretty underground. It was really underground thing. And as it started to get busy up the garden, we then did other things, I went to do things in the Hatton Rig, it was more house orientated. Went and did things in Mother Civic, it was more on bigger things. People wanted to stay up all night, but it was it was just becoming, it was growing really organically and very quickly. And within a matter of a year, six months to a year, it was becoming massive, you know, everybody was involved. And, Maybe I'll get slagged off for, for West Coast DJs for this, but I think we were slightly quicker over, off the mark over here. The Hoochie Coochie was definitely doing it before anywhere else, as far as I'm concerned. Well, obviously, Jimpy was running the Club Nine thing in uh, Motherwell. That won Best Club in Scotland um, three, three times in a row with Blues and Soul. I was resident there. In the early days, very few of us were actually playing house and techno and everything, but it snowballed very, very quickly. And I think Club Nine and the Hoot shit had a lot to do with that. Bass is loud but never unpleasant. So when the music got your soul. At that time it was so exciting, but also it was a thing where people thought, oh well this is good. What's gonna happen next year? It wasn't as if this was turning into uh, a business or something long term because it was you know, fads had kind of come and gone before, but no one expected it to kind of just increase and get better and better. At the time. Kids were needing something. At the time there wasn't anything. I mean, it was the same old mundane music that you would hear on the weekend, week out, top 40 rubbish. I mean, there, there was, every now and again a musical revolution comes along. I mean, it's happened all, all through history. It just so happened that we were there at the beginning of this one. And we, we grabbed it with both hands. And I think all the kids at that time, regardless whether you were into football or not, all the kids at that time were looking for something to get any. And they, they, everybody grabbed it. It was, it just, it just went for a ripple to a wave and it just it just kept going and it's still going. The late 80s there was an acid house scene coming on the Italian house, acid house, a little bit more techno, a harder sound than the edge that Yogi would be playing and obviously as young guys we then said this is our different generation that, that obviously the soul guys had and obviously we wanted to do our own thing, copying basically what we've seen in England. That's when we done the crew club with Boney and then next next stage was starting street rave. We'd been going to events and stuff like that. Like the, we'd went to a Sundance thing at the, the 
at the Barrowlands. It was an all-nighter that Frank Devine, an old character, an old friend of ours, had put on. And also we'd been frequenting the sub-club, etc., and other sort of, uh, nights. And we thought it would be a great idea to try and do something down the west coast of Scotland. Yeah, Bob Jeffries was actually looking outside to book, book, book the pavilion. And at the time it was all bikers every Saturday night. So he's come out and there's been a bit fucking so many fighting outside of, of these bikers or fight each other. And what time he said, fuck that, I'm not going to take that. And then obviously Jams had been from here at the time. He's at me right in, first gig we done. And we, we booked a venue and 20 years later we're still here. The date of the very, very first ever Street Rave event was the 10th of September 1989, 20 years ago, and uh, it was called West Coast Jam. Basically, wanted the best of whatever we could get. Don't, we weren't the original innovators as such, do you know what I mean? There was other people that they were doing things, right? We were looking about to see what we wanted for our slicey action for Ayrshire etc and for Scotland and we really wanted to do a test event and see exactly what we can draw and try and get the best line up we possibly can. Line up for the first gig was Graham Park, Mike Pickering who at the time were the biggest DJs in the UK. They were the residents at Hacienda and they were, that was an ideal opportunity for us to bring sort of Hacienda sound up to Scotland and at that time nobody else had done that. That's right, 1989 Air Pavilion, first street rave, me and Mike Pickering uh, drove up from Manchester. Mike. I don't know, Mike was a bit, I remember Mike being a bit reluctant going up to air and uh, we arrived uh, and we're driving around and Mike couldn't believe that we were DJing in this place and when we got to the pavilion, yeah, he was like, oh, what the hell? But it, it got really busy and it was just a fantastic night. I mean, I don't remember the specifics about it, but I remember an, an absolutely fantastic night. The volume was, it was right down, in, right in the beach. Uh, it was like a kind of white, white building. It almost looked like a castle, actually. Well, it was just like one of those run-down, kind of um, ramshackle, boring type places, do you know what I mean? An old seaside town, quite a large-looking venue. I just remember being very excited whenever I was going there. I remember tearing it over the moors to get there, because I couldn't, it was, you know, it was back in the day and it was very exciting and it was a massive gig and when you drew up to it always loads of people outside as a venue it was a flea pit and it probably get, <laughs> it probably gets shut down as a health hazard these days but you know it's just a cauldron of, of energy that's the, the way the only way i can explain what it was like when we walked into there it was like walking into a lunatic asylum <laughs> Inside the pavilion was amazing, electric. It was a big, huge balcony, right round this old dance hall. That's exactly what I had to, how I can describe it. Big stage, four, four, five feet stage, and it just looked into this this dance hall. The pavilion reminded me very much of Wigan Casino in the seventies. Dirty, dull, sweat dripping off the ceiling. <sighs> place mobbed, bodies everywhere. Just basically, it was like a throwback to the 70s when I first started going to clubs and all-nighters. When the pavilion first started, the big guys that were doing the rounds then were like Steve Williams from Manchester, Jay Weirden, Dave Seaman, Sasha, uh, Carol Cox, Judge Jaws, Noel Watson, Paul Trouble Anderson, uh, Paul Lunkerfold initially, uh, eventually. And then of course American DJ wise, it was Larry Levan, it was called DJ Herc, it was uh, um, Frankie Knuckles. London were Fabio Groove Rider, Carol Cox, Eve Lady Richards, then you come up north, you've got Graham Park, Mike Pickering, you've got Steve Williams, and a new kid at the time, DJ Sasha, who's a 17 year old, 18 year old kid that everybody was raving about Manchester. There was Danny Rant playing and Oki and uh, Alfredo and, and uh, Nicky Holloway. They were the sort of the first ones in the scene that, you know, but everybody was playing the same records, but it was, they were the, the records to play, they were great. As far as Scottish DJs were concerned, we had a good variation in Scottish DJs with Scott Gibson. Uh, 
we had Kevin Wilson for the Bomber Records, um, we had Harry from the Sub Club, uh, Slam Guys, Yogi Houghton, we had uh, Craig Smith uh, from Edinburgh, and we had uh, Jackie Morrison from Aberdeen. Timsey from Dunfermline, he used to do a night up there called Cronk. Um, as I say, this was all important to us, it was really important to get a good variation of Scottish DJs in there as well. Street Rave residents are John Messina and Ian Bonnie Clark, who have been an integral part of Street Rave and Colours for the last 20 years. Really, that was their crowd. We were coming in on Mancini the Genie's crowd, which I used to call him the Genie. You know, I, I named him Mancini the Genie. And then obviously you had Boney, right? But I'd, I'd say at the time, uh, John Mancini's crowd were like, a, a, like they were more, how can you say, they were more into the tunes. Boney's crowd were like, they're a bit younger. That was my interpretation on it, you know? John used to say we were organised chaos, which we knew we were, and we thrived in it, do you know what I mean? Because we liked the chaos, do you know what I mean? We liked the madness, we liked a good laugh. John would always be there first to set up the decks, etc., and make sure everyone was all right for the bands, day sound checks, you know, make sure that everything I'd done was right and I hadn't made any an, an arse or anything, you know. And then Boney would just turn up later on, just moaning, just moaning as usual, just, just basically. Mm -hmm. Because the dancing was relatively new, there was, no, there was that, not that many records going about. There was a lot of records, but there wasn't that many records going about that everybody could get their hands on. Pump Up The Jam, Last Rhythms, uh, Airport 89, things like that. Even though there was the same record four and five times a night, it didn't make any difference because that's what makes a classic what it is just now. You know, records became massive back then. You don't get the time now to grow and be nurtured. It's such a high turnover now. But we were nurturing records back then, and some of them became massive, i.e., you know, 808 State, records like that, and obviously the bootleg of uh, Candy Staten and things like that. They became absolute ginormous. Very few records get that big these days and stand the test of time. When, like, tunes like Pump Up The Jam and Show Me Love and, uh, you know, all those things crossed over, Black Box Ride On Time, I just thought that was fantastic to, to see those people on top of the pops miming badly and to, to hear those records on the radio I thought it was a good thing I don't think it diluted it it just helped spread the, the, the dance music and house music um, gospel Typical club at Falls Street because we were obviously for parochial towns we went for Glasgow City Centre we went for Edinburgh we used to have a big audience from Lanarkshire from West Lothian, from Falkirk, from Stirling, basically working class guys that would work all week and then go out, buy some clothes and go out party the weekend. Fashion was key, do you know what I mean? It was key. There was a lot of different looks in the pavilion. There was a lot, it was a real sportswear look. Haircuts were like bobs. There was a real sort of travel fox train shoes. You had the trip tracksuits, etc., and all that sort of stuff. You also had that sort of more sort of casual element as well with it, you know, you, you had your best company, Sloan Islands, CP, all that sort of, all the older lads wearing that. And But then you had that sort of, a sort of more cleaner look where you got Duffer St George, John Richmond, Armand Bazzi. Real mix across the board, do you know what I mean? And it was a big, a, a big event in the month, everybody dressed well for it. The, the acid house movement changed the way that people dressed and the way that people went out and people still conformed to that same sort of stereotype, although it's changed a little bit, people still conform to that image even today. Drugs and clubs have always gone hand in hand. I mean, you just got to look back to rock and roll in the 50s and, and uh, psychedelia in the 60s and punk rock in the 70s. Clubs, drugs, music, dancing, they've always gone hand in hand. But the difference with the late 80s was that little magic pill called ecstasy. That drug was, um, you know, just such a uh, potent force and Straight, I mean, obviously there was a huge outcry about how terrible it was and everything, and how people would die and all this. But I think at one point there was like two and a half million people going out and taking ecstasy every weekend. And 
you know, nobody dies. You know, there was this whole thing about how, and I think what the best thing about it is it's not addictive either, you know. You had like the Mitsubishis, the Doves, um, different different types, which still kind of lasted today. Um, and those drugs were, they mellowed everybody out. Everybody, made everybody had a good feeling, a good feeling about themselves. And that's why everybody got on with each other and put all their differences behind them. It was just ecstasy, that's what it is. Everybody was in ecstasy. The whole thing, you, you can't deny, there's no point in sitting there and pretending that it was all sweet and innocent and everybody was just drinking Lucozade at the time because they weren't, do you know what I mean? Everybody was dabbling and experimenting in drugs and all kinds of, I mean, it was mainly ecstasy, speed and acid were the three things. Put it this way, the whole place had bend the walls, do you know what I mean? Everybody was, it was a, it was a certain glow in the air, can I say, and um, if I ever needed to, there may be X amount of thousands of people in there, but if I needed to get somebody, I knew exactly where to get them. It was like just that moot around the back of your house. I knew exactly where everyone was and everybody was. And if somebody said to me, somebody's a wee bit worse for the wear, etc. and stuff like that, I knew exactly how to get there, the quickest way to get there, the route to get there, and get them sorted out, etc. and everything else. It was a family environment, we all looked after each other. Fucking Guru Josh as well. How the hell we all started playing that? I don't know. I remember he was there live and I was so off my nut. I was crawling along the front of the stage with 2,000 people in front of me and Guru Josh is standing playing his sax looking at me and I was just crawling on my hands and knees licking the floor as I was going along. Absolutely bonkers. Actually, maybe I'm wrong. There was more dangerous things going on inside those clubs. We had every main DJ you could ever think of. For Sasha, Digweed, Lauren Garney, Carol Cox, everybody. That probably was another place in Britain. It could have boasted the same DJs. I think they came to London uh, maybe and saw me play at a couple of rave parties in, initially in the early days for them to feel that they, 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 they hunted me down in some way and asked me to play this party called Street Rave in Scotland. And uh, I said, well, I've never really been to Scotland before, so, you know, I made my name very, very, very much so in the UK and playing all over the UK. But it was their enthusiasm that, that got me to, to come along, you know, because I mean, I could have came up here and gone to the worst party since sliced bread, but it wasn't possible, you know. I mean, I, I've, I've always uh, had a, an amazing time every time I've played in Scotland and, and my real beginnings was with street rave. Me and Colin actually coming to Scotland to play was a big thing. You know, I don't think he realised how much of a big thing it was because me and you, he actually opened the door to it. He came in, really, when we'd already opened the door. The Scottish people were more passionate about it. In England, it was more of, um, we've, like, you know English are, we've started this, say, so we're cool. Where the Scottish people embraced it and they're like, it was close to the heart, you know. <laughs> When we first started touring and Scotland was going to be the place we were headed to, um, I was just as excited, you know, to see the world in Scotland and what, you know, the fans, you know, how they were receptive to our music and to us as a band and to me as an artist, you know, and it was great. Uh, that's why I keep coming back all the time. In 1991-92, when we were still at the Air Pavilion, uh, we decided to venture into some uh, bigger and better uh, events. It was uh, to be the first of many, and first up that time was the infamous event which took place at Air Ice Rink. Superb. We actually took five coaches from Motherwell to Air Ice Rink. Five buses. 557 seaters from Laurel Cross to your ice rink. Oh, the queue, the queue came out and went down and went right round, all the way around the estate, to, to, to the house and the estate around the corner. Police totally flapped, shut off all the streets, etc. and stuff like that. I think they, I think they thought, we're not going to fit these people in here. Fitted most of them in. Well, 
I remember there was just like steam and condensation <laughs> pouring out of it as we approached it. From the Got inside all, like I said, all the ice had melted. So they put wooden boards on the ice and they turned into like little mini rafts by the end of it. The place was vibrating like you know, the biggest sort of tin iron base bin you've ever heard in your life but again the atmosphere although the whole thing you came out of there feeling absolutely filthy at the end of it but the whole atmosphere was incredible you could hear the sound system basically up at the race course which was just about out at the bypass so needless to say the tin roof we weren't doing any gigs there again but we kind of knew halfway through the night we're never going to get the venue again so we just cranked the sound system right up <laughs> By this time, I knew that Ricky and Jamsy were, were, had picked up the ball and, and were running with it. There, there was obviously something going on with those two guys. They, they had the balls to do what they did, and I, I, you know, I take my cap off to them. They were doing pretty much what was going on down south, but they just took it to another level. Do you know what I mean? I always, I've always liked small, intimate gigs, or you know, two thousand maximum. But they wanted to do the, the bigger thing, and I was like, ah. Oh, They've, they've what? They've hired the airport. We heard we got press with the airport. It was just like, there's no way you've got an airport. It was one of those ones, there's no chance you've got an airport. It was like, nothing you could ever imagine of hiring. It was one of the most remote things you could think of hiring. It was just like, you thought it was just out of, out of reach to get an airport, but we did get it. Robert Thompson, who was Jamsie's ball lot, could get an inroads at Presswood Airport. We just thought this is the ultimate unique venue. Nobody else would do it. we done it. And the press, if that was London, the press would be all over that. Oh, what a venue, what a venue. Two young casuals doing events for your pals to actually run an event in an international airport inside the terminal building. I think the first time when we done it in 1991 and 92, well, that's the pimples in the back of my head, my ears were standing up with 5,000 people in there all going off their heads. That was unbelievable, you know? The, uh, the Euro dance. I couldn't imagine pulling up at an airport and someone closing the airport for the night. I don't think anyone, it's like going to Heathrow. Imagine telling them to close Heathrow for the night. I don't know how they got, I don't know how they got round it with the air tower, customs. I don't you have customs at the dance party, right? And there's a rave going on and the Air Majesty's customs office is round the corner. How they got round that, I don't know to this day because I couldn't do it. It was, it was wicked actually, because I remember thinking, Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a bit scary and you walk on and then suddenly it's like oh, okay because the crowd I, I don't know what it is the crowd they, they make you feel relaxed anyway because they're like they're they're giving you something and you're you know you you sort of feel oh i'm relaxed now i can enjoy myself so lots of the crowds here are so warm and so welcoming and so enthusiastic i mean we used to like you know, you'd have gigs coming in all the time, but every time we had something in Scotland, you know, and especially the street rave parties, would really look forward to them. They'd be, you know, the ones that you'd be counting down the days and gigs you'd actually look forward to doing. We've done six events here, and I'm sure the probably right was one of the best, best events that kids have ever been to. That was a really massive thing, they, what they did. They, well, they... they they, they, they were real have a go and innovative, you know. Presswick Airport thing was a massive thing today. Real, real brilliant thing they did. You know, I think that, that took them to another level, to be quite honest, you know. We also moved uh, and spread ourselves up to, uh, we've done some uh, Big, big events at, uh, at Livingston, Livingston Forum. Um, the first one we done at Livingston Forum, there was a, a new year and there was a terrible snow blizzards, etc. and everything else. And we, the funny thing was we had sold a lot of tickets, but it was half empty. It was still a great night. And a lot of promoters would probably say, it's jinx, let's not do it again. Do you know what I mean? It was half empty, but we had sold all these tickets, which was quite strange. 
So we, we thought, well, we sold these tickets. People were trying to get to the event, but they couldn't get to the event. So we decided to do another one, and that was, yeah, again, bendy walls. Do you know what I mean? It was absolutely rammed. We were very fortunate uh, through the years that the Street Dave Massive uh, were great at travelling, and they used to still follow us wherever we went and, and to all the gigs that we'd done. And uh, the Forum in Livingston was no exception. They travelled in their thousands there, and we sold out nearly every gig. I think we'd done four, five, six gigs up there. We had the likes uh, uh, Steve Williams, uh, Sasha, Lauren Garney, Cola Boy, Utah Saints, K Class, etc. And uh, the Livingston Forum was great. I, I loved the nights up there. We left the Pavilion at probably 93, 94. Basically, the drugs had just become too much for that level. The security selling drugs. You'd, Basically, we'd be bringing people up for record companies in London, get approached to sell, buy drugs, but that next thing, and we didn't see any forward, forward way that we could still keep the pavilion if that was happening, because at the, at the end of the day, that was all the bad press that was getting the kids dying. And obviously, if we wanted to have this career, we had to make a decision. Financially, we could have stayed there and probably be multi-millionaires at the time, but at the time we had to make a decision, we left the pavilion. I'll always remember it, James Mackay coming up to me when I'm DJing, doing the last hour as usual, up at the pavilion. And he came up to me and said to me, when you finish the night and played your last tune, he says, that's us finishing the pavilion, can you announce that? And I'll never forget having to say those words. And It was a sad day, but it was it was time we'd, we'd run our race and it was time to move on. We left the pavilion and we just started doing events in the tunnel Glasgow and then we moved up to Fubar and Stirling. My recollection of the food bar was about, we went up there in 94. We had a great friendship as well with the owners, do you know what I mean? We had a real good, I mean, we used to go up there on a, a Saturday and get home on a Wednesday and stuff like that, you know what I mean? It was like they'd, again for them, it, it was like they had their business where they had a lot of pubs, clubs, etc. and everything else, but for them it was a night out as well. We were coming to town, they were getting together with us, obviously we liked a party, you know what I mean? And uh, we had a lot of good nights in there, a lot of really good nights, uh, and a lot of really good nights back at their house. We had some great nights up there and some great after parties. Um, it lasted for about three or four years uh, and every night was always rammed, solid, like the pavilions. Foo Bar at the time when we moved in there was a sort of rave capital of Scotland. It was a hardcore, obviously, element that used to go there for all nighters. We went up there and gave them a different little tilt. A thousand people, Tracy and Stephen the owners, the party ways all weekend, bright. DJs were up with the Foo Bar, we were like, uh, Sasha, John Digweed, Carol Cox, D Ream, people that would work with Air Pavilion. I think the thing that was always good about s s coming and playing in Scotland was it was the, the raw kind of energy from the crowd. They were, gave a lot back and very vocal. It's, there's a lot of testosterone. It's, it's always a good crowd to play to. It's, it's definitely not for the faint hearted because yeah, they want a good time, so you got to deliver. From about 1993-94, as, as the music and dance music progressed, there became kind of two elements of music. One was more kind of happy, feel-good music, and the other one was more kind of hardcore, really hard industrial sound and stuff. Um, that's when all Resurrections and Hangar 13 all started to appear and it was a different kind of crowd that went to those for hours. And it was more druggy, more a rougher type of music, bouncy, rougher, it was a, a horrible scene, you know. Totally different for the street rave, the Club Nine, the Hat and Rig, all these, the, the Civics. That hardcore thing was, was a, a rough and druggy, more druggy element, you know. Basically, time 94, 95, it was a year of, basically, that was a year of Super Club. Gay Crasher, God's Kitchen, Cream and Vinted, and at the time, it was a mega sponsorship deals. And Street Rave, as a name, as a label, was bad karma. The name Rave didn't happen, and a lot of people weren't wanting to be associated with the name Rave. So, we decided at the time to try and get a different brand started, and we obviously, colours. 
And then from then onwards, we just moved away from that sort of thing. And then we just moved on to a kind of more, um, just something different. Do you know what I mean? Just a new, a new brand and new, new progression. Move on, move away from what we've done before. We have obviously got to get new punters and new. Obviously, people people have grown up through the scene. We've got to move on to what's 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 obviously relevant for that time period. So there had to be that progression of changing and maturing as a club. A lot of street name name still lives today. We had to eventually change it to make it a more appealing to a bigger crowd. Street Dave was always still there and we done regular uh, birthday parties just to keep the name going and, and that, that type of thing. But um, it was onwards and upwards with the new brand which was called Colours. Street Dave as a club now don't do weekly events or monthly events, they do a yearly event to keep that name going, to keep that name alive and bring all the old crowd back. Uh, we do a, a birthday party every year in the Arches, which is just a huge event now. Every single year everybody's looking, to, looking forward to, to the, the Street Dave party in the Arches and we got all the big DJs up. Anybody you can think of, we've had them at the Arches and that means everybody. It's good to reminisce with everyone. You go there, you see everyone and uh, it's good and you talk about old times and that and it's, it's as if you've, it's, it's quite funny because it's as, you may not have seen these people for a decade or maybe even longer and when you talk to them it's as if you only spoke to them yesterday. The people who come to Street Rave or Colours at the Arches just make me feel so welcome, you know, and, and it's just smiles all round and, you know, I, I mean, look at photographs of me playing the Arches, I've always got a smile on my face. Mainly because Ricky is standing behind the speaker up to no good, and I'm like, hey! It's quite amazing to think that something can last that long because that is a generation, that's a whole generation. And if people are still liking it, I mean, last time I came up, it was really good. So it's, it's amazing that it's lasted that long. It's incredible. That is a superb achievement. It's, it's an incredible achievement. You know, um, how many clubs have, have come and gone, you know what I mean, over the years? You know, Studio 54 didn't last that long. And it's just got bigger and bigger, hasn't it? Street rave, you know. It's 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 never um, it's never faltered. It just gets bigger and bigger. It, it is a privilege to be there, beginning because you see kids go out these days in the party and the club scene and think this is great, this is new. But by the way, it's no new because we were there at the beginning. And at the beginning, I mean, we kicked off a revolution. I mean, we changed the face. Of us as, as, as party goers and Ricky and Jamsy as promoters, we changed the, the scene all over Scotland. Working with Ricky and Jamsy over 20 years has been a, let's put it bluntly, a nightmare. Um, but at the same time, it's, I wouldn't change anything for the world. It's, the, the amount of fun times we've had uh, and fun times we still do have has been it's great. Jamsy was a co-founder co of Street Rave. Obviously, with his other work commitments, couldn't do it forever, but at the end of the day, we wouldn't be able to do it without him. Ricky McGowan, to me, obviously, a close friend, you know what I mean, as far as our business partner was concerned in the past. He hung on in there when I basically, I wanted to fall away and, and do my own sort of thing with the shops and stuff. And he basically, I mean, he comes across as being a sort of happy-go-lucky, etc. and all that sort of guy, but he's really, really clued up business-wise. He knows exactly, he's got a vision for what he wants to do. He's, he's He's organised things a year in advance, etc. and everything else. He's through the biggest parties in Scotland. He's kept the whole scene going in Scotland, as far as I'm concerned. And he will continue to keep it going until whatever. From my experience with Ricky, I don't know why he, he, he does this, but uh, it was always a, a little party trick of his, where he always wa wanted to get naked. And, um, and everyone around him tried to stop him getting naked. But it didn't quite work because he, at the time he was quite slim and slippery and he just used to run around everybody and eventually he'd get naked. So yeah, his pants were always off. Uh, after I think it was just his way of celebrating <laughs> after his, one, of, one of his parties. And this was just funny because he would just, he'd just wait there and he'd just think, how long is it going to take for him to get his kit off? <laughs> I grew up at Street Rave and without trying to sound too dramatic, 
it made me into the person I'm today. It's, it's a big achievement. You know, where, you know, where's like open fold and I see and they've all gone. You know, and it, it, it needs recognising that like people like John Mancini, Boney, you know, Ricky Jamsey, keeping it going. That's a that's a long time. You know, 20 years is a long time. It's nearly a life sentence. I started Street Life 20 years ago and it's been half my life and the people that I've met, the friends and obviously everybody else who I've met on the journey, I wouldn't change it for the world and I do that. It's, it's part of my life and hopefully the people that I've met over the last 20 years will still have them in another 20 years. If I could die tomorrow, I can see I've done it, do you know what I mean? As far as like said, lifetime achievements. The whole, the whole sort of era, the whole, the, every gig was just amazing, do you know what I mean? It was just an experience every time and second to none, do you know what I mean? To do it, it's just like, at that way back at the beginning when nobody else was doing anything, it was just so fresh, so different. And uh, I've got a lot of friends now who've got family, etc. A lot of people met and married from the pavilion. You know, it's just so many connections made for different parts of Scotland. It's just spot on. It's a fantastic achievement for MD, you know. I think they've done fantastically well to, to I think he's come through some tough times, which we all know, you know, and we've all been together during these times, you know, we've I've been together all the world with Ricky, travelling and involved in the music scene with him. I think he's done really, really well to keep it together, especially with the last two or three years. It's been tough. But he's, he's done fantastically well, and uh, the best of luck to him, you know. It's given me 20 years of good times, memories. Never forget it. Probably the best 20 years of my life. Unbelievable.